Our guests on This is America in the World are the Reverend Jesse Jackson, founder and president of the Rainbow Push Coalition, U.S. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Democrat, representing the 43rd Congressional District of California, and the Reverend Al Sharpton, civil rights and social justice activist, founder of the National Action Network, and host of his own weekly television series on MSNBC. You've been fighting the fight for a long time. Are you exhausted? No, I'm, I'm in fact invigorated because every once in a while you win. And, and it is the wins that you understand if you hadn't have kept fighting, you wouldn't have seen wins. You mm. know, uh, I've been able in my lifetime to stand in the square in Johannesburg the night that the ANC and Nelson Mandela won uh, for uh, the ANC won as the ruling party in South Africa, the first democratic election. I was there as an election observer. I was there when Barack Obama put his hand on the Bible and became the first black president of the United States. So I've seen too much to uh, get tired. Because every time I get weary, I think of those days that if we had not kept going, those days would have never happened. So. It is certainly, given my experience, it would be certainly uh, less than uh, accurate uh, of uh, appraisal of my journey for me to ever get tired. Uh, we see systemic racism on one side of the coin, and then President Biden speaking about equity and unity on the other side of the coin. Can you address both of those at the same time? I think that uh, when you look at systemic racism, and I give credit to uh, President Biden, for he's the first president I know in an inaugural address called it that systemic racism. I never heard a president say that. And he, and he called out white supremacy. It, and, but systemic racism, people need to understand, is not a slogan. It means it's baked into the cake. It's baked into the fabric. Reinhold Niebuhr wrote a book many years ago, A Moral Man in Immoral Society. It is not just the guy that walks around with the Confederate flag or that calls the N-word. It is the inherent unfairness. It is the inherent advantage one gets over the other. It's the inherent inequality that we must go and address and deal with getting out. And I think that by uh, this president addressing it, uh, it at least gives us the right focus. Now, how well he will do in it, we will all be judging and holding him accountable for, and we told him that. But at least he is focused on that it's going to take more than a press conference or oratory. We're going to have to dig in, deal with the very threads of this country, and re, uh, uh, re-thread it, really, and, and and bring it from the absolute fabric uh, that is built in and baked into the fabric of this country. When we're on the street and walking past a, a restaurant or a, an office building, uh, maybe a, a drugstore, something like that, and we see a sign in the window that says Black Lives Matter, what do you want us to feel? What do you want us to think? Well, I think that uh, that slogan, uh, which became a hashtag, started the night George Zimmerman was acquitted for the killing of uh, Trayvon Martin. And three brilliant young ladies wrote that slogan, and it caught on. For me, when I see it, I want the people that see that to say that Black lives matter, so they should be treated as equally as anyone else, Mm -hmm. equal protection under the law, equal opportunity. That's all. No favors. We're not asking for no one to do something uh, any different. Just don't treat us differently. And there were those that came out and say, well, all lives matter. But all lives were not treated unequal. You must remember, by law, we were treated unequal. There's been others in this country discriminated against, but there were not laws against them. There were laws that said we couldn't go to certain schools that we couldn't live in certain neighborhoods, that we couldn't even drink out of a certain water fountain. My mother, I'm a generation away from the back of the bus. My mother, born and raised in Cal- in, in Alabama, I was raised and born in Brooklyn, New York. My mother uh, couldn't go to certain schools. 
So this is not some distant past. Mm -hmm. This is my kid's grandmama and granddaddy. By law, Rosa Parks was arrested not because she broke a custom, she broke the law. And that is why we need to say we matter equally because America wouldn't have to undo what America did by law. I'm wondering, what was your first brush with prejudice or discrimination? Well, the, the first incident I remember was when um, I was a youngster, my parents used to go south for Christmas. Uh, my mother, as I said, was from Alabama, my father from Florida, and we used to drive down. In those days, uh, there was not a lot of us flying. We're talking in the 50s. I might have been five or six years old. And uh, we stopped to get some food in North Carolina. And my father had been an amateur boxer. He was an entrepreneur, muscular man. And, and was uh, uh, pretty successful, brand new Cadillac every year. He went into this store, uh, restaurant, take out, to get some hamburgers to bring to the car for us to keep driving to Florida. He came back with his head down and uh, had this weird look on his face. And I noticed he had nothing in his hands. And he got in the car and just pulled off. And I said, what happened to the food? I'm a kid, five or six years old. <laughs> oh, they don't serve us there. And to see my father, who I thought could beat everybody in the neighborhood, former boxer, muscular, Al Sharpton senior, humiliated in front of his children, I understood that for the first time the graphic nature of racism. Now, as I grew older, I learned where I went to school, where I lived, uh, all of the uh, health care services. All of that was racism, but it wasn't obvious. That was the obvious display of racism that I never forgot. When you uh, were watching television and you were watching the mob uh, take over the Capitol on January 6th, uh, threatening democracy, I think. If democracy folds, the conversation about race doesn't even begin to matter, huh? If democracy folds, uh, race not only doesn't matter, but any inkling of our getting fairness and justice doesn't matter because we'll be ruled by a mob that have no problem saying that they're supremacists. To think that they would walk in the United States Capitol building with Confederate flag and Nazi sign and gallow, these people, if they were in charge and if they were successful, in interfering with the electoral college vote being confirmed, no telling what they would do in terms of race relation. It was frightening. If we just took that video and transfixed it to any Capitol building at any other nation in the world, we would be talking about whether the United States should help send in the military to help stabilize that country. Well, imagine how we look to the world and imagine how we look to those of us that have suffered at the hands of mobs like that in the country. It gave us graphically all of the visions of what our forefathers went through and what we went through uh, that we need. It was a frightening experience. If you took 12 of them, Reverend, 12 of the people who breached the Capitol and sat them around the table, and invited you to participate, what would you ask them? What would you say to them? I would, one, ask them what would make them feel that there was some fraud in the election, that what evidence could they present? And what kind of country do they want where people can storm the, co the country's capital because they don't like the results of an election? And what would make them glorify the Confederate flag, which were people that led a insurrection that really was traitors to the country? So how do you, on one hand, talk about make America great, and you are with those that committed treason against the country? That's a treasonous flag. I would want them to explain the inherent contradiction in their position and explain to me why they thought they had the right to rule over other people, but at the same time claim they're doing it in the name of a country that's supposed to stand for the democratic way. 
Reverend, are we at the crossroads of this reckoning with race in America? I think we are at the crossroads. I think that we are going to have to decide which road we're going to take. Are we going to get back on the track of those uh, like Dr. King, like Goodman, Cheney, and Swinner, black and white, that had put this nation on one course that was continued by many of us after them and by uh, many in the elected office like an Obama? Or are we going the route that Trump so graphically laid out and made clear? And I think that most Americans understand that we're going to have to make a choice and we're going to have to admit to ourselves it's going to be a hard choice because it's going to take hard work either way. It is not going to come from the sky down. It's going to come from the ground up and it's going to take all of us working on the ground. Reverend, uh, thank you for leading the fight uh, for the uh, National Action uh, Network, for your television uh, program. And uh, uh, I'm just uh, honored that you joined us. Thank you so much. Well, I'm honored that you invited me. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Underwriting for This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., featuring the 29th National Japan Bowl, a Japanese language and culture competition, streaming live April 9th, 2021. The National Association for Children of Addiction. Faces and Voices of Recovery. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. And the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. Reverend Jesse Jackson is one of America's foremost civil rights leaders. He's the founder and president of the Rainbow Push Coalition, twice was a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and is the author of Keeping Hope Alive. Reverend Jackson, first of all, thank you for keeping hope alive. Thank you for allowing me to be on the show with you again, Dennis. Um, I admire you very much. Thank you. Greenville, South Carolina in 1960. Was that your first protest? Yes, uh, January, July 17, 1967, seven of us, eight of us were the center of the public library. We were arrested trying to use the public library. At the time, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. I did not see a black policeman, a fireman, 20 years old, never black on the school board, or any separate graveyards, hospitals, total racial segregation, 1960. There's a new South now in so many ways. I look at Clemson play Alabama in the big game. Now the, the, it's a new day in many ways. Rich zone tie, continental tie in South Carolina. The industry moving south, people moving south. It, in many ways, it's a new day. Atlanta, male, black men in Atlanta and Savannah and Augusta, Dallas, Houston. Uh, most, most major cities in the south have black mayors. Very different. When you think of your era of protest, and now we have a Black Lives Matter, uh, do you have advice uh, for them as an organization as to how to effectively protest? Well, they, as, as a movement, they, they are in the great tradition of protest. The Black Lives March demonstrated were, were very white, very black, and very brown. Some all white town marked with Black Lives. Black Lives Matter became a, a famous reference, not just the skin color. The point of view of saying, let's, let's coexist, not co annihilate. And so this time around, they actually voted. Dr. King said in the speech in Washington in 63, I look forward to the day when sons and daughters of former slave and slave members sit around the common table. But I see what Raphael Warnock and also around the common table, that's fulfillment of the, that dream. So see, on the other hand, while you see that 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 wave going forward, this undercurrent just sort of take the capital over January 6th. Are we living in a violent society? We, we've been violent all the while, but we, it's more violent now. You have these uh, high-tech violent people. They've abused the Second Amendment. And they, they're in our military, they're in the police force. Men in the police forces are, in fact, uh, uh, are racist, racist disguised as policemen. And they kill without conscience. 
they're protected from accountability. So you have the killing in Charleston, South Carolina, where nine people killed, and the police stop and get the guy hamburger on the way to the jail. I mean, that was a statement, you know. Uh, the the, uh, uh, the killing of George Floyd, uh, the killing in in uh, in South Carolina. The killings continue. It's a season of violence here, and it was encouraged to see by the last president, but President Biden has opened up a new chapter, and that's a welcome chapter. 60 blacks in the Congress, 45 Latinos in the Congress. That coalition uh, is bearing fruit today. I get a feeling that you're hopeful. I'm full of hope because I've seen so much change in my lifetime. I, I, I tell you, I grew up in South Carolina, we never saw a black policeman. Since then, we've had a black police chief in Greenville. We've had a black chairman of school board in Greenville, South Carolina. So I've, I've seen progress take place. I mean, I cannot let uh, the, this capital scene of January 6th blot out January the 5th, where, uh, where Warnock and also, and they won. They changed the Senate, they changed the options of, of, of legislation. The reason why Joe Biden can sign legislation today is that the black vote in South Carolina put him over and he, he, he made a run after that. So you see the, the black vote too long denied and the Latino vote denied. That's my, my hope is we, we have weapons we didn't have 50 years ago. If there's one thing uh, that you would want to put in the book uh, and tell uh, white folks, what would it be? What would you want to say to them? When you look at uh, the day you have Nancy Pelosi in the House, a woman, and her coalition is, is, is prevailing. You have Biden, who's in the, the, the Dresden of Johnson. He's going to be a great president, by the way. Joe Biden is going to be a great president. Uh, he kind of come in and like, like Lyndon Johnson came in, kind of low expectations. But it's all said and done, you're going to have Lincoln, Johnson, and Biden. It's all over. I think but he, his gifts are abundant. He is, uh, uh, he, his, 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 up, his ups and his downs. It's pain and sorrow, it's sunshine, his rain makes him a good guy for this period. He, he's the right dose of medicine we need. He didn't come to Harris, it's a great combination. But we, we, won, the, we won a big campaign. It's a big lie that Biden didn't win, he did win. And because he won, he's now changing the course of America. I thank him and I thank those, those who voted for him. I think about Raphael Warnock in Georgia. So if you're sick enough, Nick, sick enough, Nick, the number of whites voted for him. That's why he sent him. He couldn't have won without white votes. And also couldn't have won without black votes. That black and white coalition in, in Memphis, Georgia, it will not remain in Georgia. It's going to affect Alabama. It's going to affect the rest of the South. When the South changes, America changes. I think America's changing for the better. Uh, against great odds, we're, 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 we're swimming up, we're swimming upstream, but we're, but we're, we're swimming nonetheless. But I think that the, 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 history, the history is on our side. We're going to get better. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, it's good to be with you once again. And uh, I'm, I'm ever so glad that you set some time aside so we could have this conversation. You've given us a good education. Along the course, she's a superstar. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend. Thank you very much. Thank you, then. The Honorable Maxine Waters is a 15-term U.S. Congresswoman. She's a Democrat representing the 43rd Congressional District of California and is the chair of the House Financial Services Committee. We're doing these television programs on reckoning with racism in America. What would you want white people to know? I've been thinking a lot about the civil rights movement, the sacrifices that were made, and the, the changes um, uh, that were um, realized. And I know and I do believe uh, that, you know, people of color and black people in particular have done everything that we could possibly do uh, to change the hearts and minds of, uh, of whites who still don't believe at this day and age that we're equal uh, to them and that we're deserving of a decent quality of life uh, and still who think uh, that uh, we must be uh, supervised, we must be uh, kept in our place. Um, and uh, when I think about this, I keep thinking, who else has a responsibility to undo this thinking? And it's whites. Good thinking white people who live, you know, ordinary lives 
in their jobs uh, with their families and who are thinking that they're doing a good job simply by making this information known uh, by being the kind of broadcasters uh, who will have people on like me. Uh, but I think that's good, but I think perhaps that's not enough. And this is a burden that I think many whites uh, really must, must take as their responsibility. And that's this. And this is in the private lives and the private associations and the interactions that they have. They know and they see things that they've got to confront, whether it is a grandfather who still lives with the family or who, you know, we're having dinner with on Sunday and they're still using the N word. And you just, you know, you say, oh, that's, you know, he, he, he comes from, you know, the olden times. He doesn't know any better. I think that all of these instances have to be dealt with and confronted because oftentimes if you deal with grandpa around, uh, you know, a special dinner, Thanksgiving and Christmas or what have you, the young people are there too. This is a family, what have you. And they haven't heard you really say, let's stop and let's talk about this. Uh, because these kind of things are not really dealt with in those kind of settings. When you're in the workplace and you have colleagues who are saying and doing things and taking actions that are adverse to the well being of uh, people of color and African Americans. I think that it can be dealt with, and it doesn't have to be dealt with in a confrontation, but take them aside and say that, look, everybody's talking about the fact that that person over there of color deserved that promotion. And we know that you have the power. And what you have done is you have used your power to promote above them, uh, to not give them credit, and I, you know, I just, I'm watching and I'm seeing, and I just thought I'd share with you what I think about what I'm seeing. And hey, you, you can do what you want to do, but I just thought it was my, my responsibility to let you know that uh, I understand and I see, and I think that, you know, you could do differently. There are a million and one opportunities. And one of the things that I'm worried about is the morning of the invasion of our capital, I saw young people in their 20s and their 30s already up with signs marching toward you know, the capital, I believe. And we saw some of them actually breaking into the capital with their fists. They didn't even have a weapon in their hand. One guy wrapped it around his and was hitting on the glass. And that was a picture that was shown over and over again. And I'm thinking to myself, these are not just elderly racists. These are younger whites now who are joining in this movement. What is it that's uh, inspiring them and motivating them uh, to be out here? And how do we get you know, parents and grandparents who are people who have fought against racism, uh, worked in the civil rights movement, are they talking to them? Now what you have, having seen the insurrection that we saw at the Capitol, where people we trust, some of them Capitol Police, who are supposed to be looking out for our welfare, where we see military officers who have been high ranking sometimes in the military. And uh, police uh, who work in our police forces, who joined in and took part in this. And we have to trust whites in all of our ways that we live our lives. We have to trust white doctors. We have to trust white bankers. We have to trust white people. And now we're saying, is he one of them? secretly and given the opportunity, would he do something to harm me? I mean, all of a sudden, you don't know anymore, you know, who's whom and whether or not uh, people that you have to trust in your daily lives are really people that really are holding uh, these thoughts of racism and separatism and given the right time or the opportunity 
uh, that it will show up. Isn't this an awful place for us to be? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, you've done an awful lot for the country, and we thank you for your service, uh, and thank you for being with us on this program. Talking to a Maxine Waters, who, you know, some of the others really don't like, uh, because I tend to say what's on my mind. And that's exactly what we want, so thank you. For information about This Is America and the World, visit our website, thisisamerica.net, or our YouTube channel, This Is America TV, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Underwriting for This Is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., featuring the 29th National Japan Bowl, a Japanese language and culture competition, streaming live April 9th, 2021. The National Association for Children of Addiction. Faces and Voices of Recovery. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Sultanate of Oman. the Kingdom of Morocco, and the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy.